Tonight on Reporting Scotland. There's criticism President Trump has failed to honour his promise to invest a billion pounds in the North East. The Code of Conduct for Politicians at Holyrood is to be reviewed after recent complaints of sexual harassment. 200 emergency calls to Police Scotland have not been handled properly, according to the Scottish Conservatives. A charity is warning people with the degenerative illness Parkinson's disease are facing unnecessary assessments for the new disability payments. On my bad days, my bad periods, I cannot do simple things like button a shirt or cut up a piece of meat. Also on the programme. It's been confirmed Malky Mackay will not be given the Scotland manager's job on a permanent basis. Tonight will be his only match as interim manager. Hello there, good evening. Donald Trump has failed to honour his investment promises to Scotland, says former First Minister Alex Salmond. Before his election, the US President said he'd spend a billion pounds developing a golf resort in Aberdeenshire. But most of that has yet to be built. Here's our political correspondent, Glenn Campbell. Three, two, two one. one. Donald Trump was allowed to build a golf course on protected sand dunes north of Aberdeen, because it was decided the scale of the investment he promised justified the environmental damage. We're talking about you know, hundreds of millions of pounds of investment. The whole project will be an extremely expensive project, a billion dollar project. Two billion dollars or a billion pounds to come into Aberdeenshire, to come into Scotland. Donald Trump promised to invest a billion pounds here on the Many Estate, creating thousands of jobs. But ten years after the Scottish Government called in his planning application, most of that has yet to materialise. The former First Minister thinks that's not good enough. The people who are putting it forward did not live up and honour the agreements that they had made to the Scottish people. The Trump Organisation promised to build a 450-bedroom hotel, two championship standard golf courses and almost 1,500 residential and holiday homes. A decade on, there's one course, a clubhouse and a 16-bedroom hotel and some lodges, but no new homes. The leader of Aberdeenshire Council's always backed the development, but does he think it was worth letting it go ahead? For what is only there just now, no, because the economic, develop, the economic benefit hasn't come through. Um, but in the, in the big picture that was put in front of us ten years ago, it was worth doing. What duty does the Trump Organisation have to deliver those benefits? I think they have an obligation to bring forward what they promised. It's, 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 that's the bottom line of it. The, the difficulty we have is we can't force them to do that. The Trump team say they've already spent around £100 million developing the site, about 10% of what was originally promised. It's not the billion pounds worth of investment and the potential for 6,000 jobs that was promised. Um, but we haven't finished. You know, the project is um, it's a multi-phase project and, you know, we're not stupid. They now have plans for a village with a mixture of homes for sale and holiday accommodation for rent. The idea of the Grand Hotel, is that gone now? Well, I think for now, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. I think you just need to look at... The world's uh, changed. The world's changed, the hotel industry in the northeast of Scotland has changed dramatically. Well, I think the Trump Organisation, whoever's putting forward the proposals, will have a huge credibility problem in persuading this generation of planners and councillors in Aberdeenshire uh, to believe the commitments they are now making, given the track record of the, of the last 10 years. Trump put construction on hold while he fought and lost a legal battle against an offshore wind farm near his course. The 11 turbine project has now got the go-ahead. Despite that, the Trump organisation is expected to bring forward revised house-building plans early in the new year. Glenn Campbell reporting Scotland, Aberdeenshire. And you can see more of Glenn's documentary, Donald Trump, Scotland's President, tonight at 9 o'clock on BBC One Scotland. Holyrood has been dominated today by further controversy over complaints of sexual harassment. The Code of Conduct for MSPs is to be reviewed and may be upgraded. And a helpline opened on Monday had attracted four calls by yesterday evening. This from our political editor, Brian Taylor. 
Traverse Theatre Company rehearse Locker Room Talk, which they're performing in Holyrood tonight. It's created from real, Trump-style male chat. I mean, obviously, I want people to have equal rights and all that, but it's when it's shut in your face. And as Blythe Duff, one of the actors, notes, it's highly topical. If ever there was a time where it should be going into the Scottish Parliament, it's now, my goodness, what a week. Nicola Sturgeon faced questions again about Mark MacDonald, who quit as a minister, apparently over inappropriate text messages. First Minister, if the standard of behaviour is not good enough for someone to remain as a minister, then how can it be good enough for an MSP? The First Minister didn't answer that directly, but she did say the offence fell far short of a criminal act. That behaviour was about language, not physical conduct. And while I think it justified the step Mark Macdonald took, let me also make it clear that it was not language that would come in any way close to being something that would require to be referred to the police. In Parliament, the writing's on the wall for sexual harassment. The Code of Conduct will also be reviewed and urgent actions likely to reform the governing corporate body, which is currently all male. Today, they faced questions. Labour's Monica Lennon has complained about past abuse from a party colleague. She set the context. What we are all discussing today is not a sex scandal, but an abuse of power, usually by senior men over women. Labour's Daniel Johnson questioned why Holyrood served alcohol. I've been struck by the observations of many people from outside this place that it is odd that we have a bar in what is meant to be a place of work. Now, the consumption of alcohol is not an excuse for harassment, but bars and free alcohol at receptions make drinking culture part of this job. Thank you but Mr. that drew sharp criticism from women. And I am deeply concerned that a question such as that asked by Daniel Johnson may give the impression that in some way women should avoid these settings in order to protect themselves. Indeed, in the worst case scenario, this could be viewed in some way as victim blaming. <laughs> And tonight, MSPs joined the audience for locker room talk, art leading life, perhaps. Brian Taylor, reporting Scotland, Hollywood. Scotland could become the second country in the world to allow 16-year-olds to change gender on their birth certificates. At present, you have to be over 18 and apply to a panel. The Scottish Government has unveiled plans to make the whole process easier and less intrusive for people who are transgender or who identify as neither male nor female. Here's our health and social care correspondent, Shelley Joffrey. I came out when I was like 15 and like I'm now like 18. I've like been like waiting to like medically transition for like so long. Jack Sinclair has lived as a man for three years. Hi, so I am on testosterone. Now it's been a month and uh, I think that my voice has dropped a bit, like a little bit. Like I feel like it's dropped a bit. <laughs> but his birth certificate still says female. At one point in the GP service I was turned away because they were just so confused at the, the, uh, the GP service because I had two different names and like my birth certificate said I was female but my ID said I was male and it was just like a mess. Um, so uh, it's quite a stressful situation to be in. If the Scottish Government's new proposals become law, young people like Jax could change their birth certificates at 16 simply by filling out a form. Norway is the only country in the world that currently allows self-declaration so young. We have to uh, you know, understand that 16-year-olds do indeed uh, know their own mind, uh, they will know their own uh, gender identity and at 16 people are allowed to vote, allowed to enter a civil partnership uh, and they're allowed to marry. Some equality campaigners think even under 16s should be allowed to change with parental consent. They want to end what they see as an unnecessarily intrusive process. I got my psychiatric report rejected at first and so like, kind of, I had to sort of describe what toys I played with as a child. I'd been living um, in my gender identity for about seven years at that point and I'd, um, I, I, it, it, was just, it was just so exasperating and so humiliating. Um, and I'm quite a confident person and it made me feel so stressed and insecure. A record 213 young people were referred to Scotland's only gender identity clinic last year, according to figures obtained by the BBC. The waiting time to be seen is a year. I just want to sound like a lad and look like a lad. Hi guys, welcome to my vlog. If today's proposals are accepted, young people like Jax could see a change in the law by 2020. Shelley Joffrey reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. 
200 emergency calls to Police Scotland have not been handled properly, according to the Scottish Conservative leader Ruth Davidson. She's been highlighting cases where officers had not been deployed or where they had been sent to wrong addresses. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon says significant improvements to call handling have been made and would continue to be made. Stephen Gordon reports. Charles Gordon murdered his sister Elizabeth Bow in her St Andrews home. Her death preventable, according to the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner, if officers had responded to her 999 call more quickly. First Minister's questions, and we start with question number one. A system not working as it should, Ruth Davidson told Holyrood, holding a list of 200 other notable incidents recorded since last November. A suicidal man was told to hang up. In another, two separate call handlers failed to record a report of a dead body in the house. In another, uh, a couple rang 999 to report that their front door was being kicked in, but didn't get any help because firstly the wrong address was written down and secondly police officers weren't even dispatched. I will uh, never, uh, never ever stand here and say anything other than that the type of cases we've uh, heard reported this week or the ones that Ruth Davidson has quoted in this chamber are in anything other than completely unacceptable. Uh, but in accepting that, uh, it would equally be wrong for me somehow to say that no improvements have been made. In the wake of the M9 tragedy in 2015, a review of call handling was ordered and recommendations produced. Two years on, those responsible say there's been progress. There are a significant number of calls every year, 500,000 of which are treble nine calls, and 97% of those are answered within 10 seconds. There is improvement, but there are still a small number of things requiring to be addressed. Recording notable incidents was one of the adopted recommendations, a positive step, say Police Scotland. But, as exchanges at Holyrood illustrate, the substance of many are the source of continuing concern. Stephen Godden, reporting Scotland. Plans have been announced for what's described as a no-frills private school. A charity hopes to set up a school in Scotland that would charge parents around £50 a week. The plans are still at an early stage, but the people involved include the former Director General of the CBI, Lord Digby Jones, and a Professor of Education at an English university. Well, our education correspondent Jamie McIver joins me now. So, Jamie, how advanced is this scheme? I would say it was a serious plan, but still not a solid one. Now, the aim is to have a business model not unlike the business model of the budget airlines. Fees of £50 or so a week, which would be affordable, it's argued, to parents who can't currently afford a private school for their children. Now, we spoke to some parents outside a state school this afternoon to see if they might be potentially interested. It seems strange that the very idea of private school seems a bit defunct, really. Um, for now, private school is very expensive. It's just like 5000 or more than per annual. So if there's a child that can pay like £52, then that's great. It, it depends. You have to experience to know. And it's just the cost. It doesn't say much. Now, some mixed views there, Katrina. The people behind the scheme, it's a new charity called the Schools Educational Trust, and it's currently looking for a site, perhaps in Glasgow or Edinburgh, and the school we're talking about could maybe have 200 students. And if that school were to be a success, then others could follow elsewhere in Scotland. Mm. But setting up a brand new school must be quite a difficult and risky thing to do. It's, it certainly would be. Indeed, I've spoken to people in the existing independent sector who are very sceptical about all this. Independent schools at the moment do, of course, offer bursary to some families, but sending a child to a brand new untried school and then paying £2,500 or so a year for the privilege, that would be a very big decision for a parent to make. There's a question of finding a suitable building, the question of recruiting suitable staff who are qualified to teach in Scotland, then that question of finding a viable business model. But this, if this does get off the ground, though, it certainly would be well worth keeping an eye on. Mm, absolutely. Thanks very much, Jamie. You're watching BBC Reporting Scotland. It's 17 minutes to 7. A reminder of tonight's top story. Donald Trump has been accused of breaking his billion pounds investment promise to Scotland by former First Minister Alex Salmond. And still to come, we hear from a confident Gregor Townsend as he prepares for his home coaching debut of the Scotland rugby team at Murrayfield this weekend. 
Well, the UK government's been accused of causing distress to people with Parkinson's. It's claimed 1,500 Scots households are dealing with the condition and are being reassessed under changes to the benefit system. But the Department for Work and Pensions says the reforms mean support can be tailored to each person's needs. Andrew Black reports. David was diagnosed with Parkinson's five years ago. The degenerative nature of his disease means his health will only get worse. David used to run an international PR agency. Now he takes life one step at a time. On my bad days, my bad periods, I cannot do simple things like button a shirt or cut up a piece of meat or prepare a meal or take a shower, for that matter. I went to university here. Uh, David was given state help for life under the UK government's old system, but benefit changes mean he's now reassessed every five years. David's currently getting the same level of assistance as before, but he's worried that could change. It's a huge source of stress and anxiety because getting to the office is one thing, undergoing the assessment is another thing, but then waiting for the result is one of the most stressful things of all because you just don't know. David's not alone. One charity says 1,500 Scots households dealing with Parkinson's face reassessment by the Department for Work and Pensions. What we really need them to do in this case is to stand by their own guidance that says that people who've already been assessed as having a very high level of disability should not have to go through the stress and hassle of being reassessed. In a statement, the Department for Work and Pensions said we do not recognise these figures. It added that the new system takes a much wider look at the way an individual's health condition or disability impacts them on a daily basis and is tailored to suit each individual's needs. This was one of David's good days. He was able to drive. But for the bad ones that lie ahead, he wants more reassurance he'll get the help that's needed. Andrew Black, Reporting Scotland. A man has been arrested in connection with a death in South Ayrshire more than 24 years ago. Ansar Shah was stabbed to death in a car park on Ayr's seafront on the 4th of October 1993. Police Scotland said a 51-year-old man had been arrested on a European arrest warrant in Frankfurt in Germany. The mother of a man who was punched to death has criticised the four-year sentence his 17-year-old killer received. Sean Woodburn died after being attacked outside a pub in Leith on New Year's Day. Denise Syme has been speaking to our reporter Lisa Summers. Losing a child is just one of the worst things in the world. And nobody should have to go through it. Denise Syme is still numb. She can't believe her son is gone. He was just a lovely guy and people could speak to him. He was sensible. You know, his friends say they were, he was the one that said, come on guys, we're not getting involved in this. And for him to be the one that this happens to, it's, it's just devastating. Everybody's devastated. <laughs> Sorry. Sean Woodburn's killer was originally charged with murder. He was convicted of culpable homicide. The 17-year-old was sentenced to four years. What do you think needs to be done now? We knew that because he was a youth, he wouldn't get a huge sentence. But to give somebody four years for assaulting five other people and then killing Sean, it's just not long enough. Doing this uh, appeal and trying to get people involved it's so we can move forward and go to the Justice Secretary and say this needs to be looked at. The Crown Office say it will consider whether the sentence was unduly lenient. The Justice Office says a judge will take into account the particular facts and circumstances of the case, as well as the age of the offender when sentencing. I just want us all to try and get back to some sort of normality, but I can't if this guy's going to come out in a couple of years' time and, you know be walking the streets when my kids, my daughters are out there. Lisa Summers, Reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. Now, just weeks after the pain of missing out on World Cup qualification, Scotland are back in action tonight. Following last month's sacking of Gordon Strachan, Malky Mackay takes interim charge for the friendly against the Netherlands at Pitodry. Our senior football reporter Chris McLaughlin is there. Yes, confirmation first of all that Malky Mackay will not be taking the job on a permanent basis. There were suggestions he might, but after tonight, he will be going back to the day job. 
Malky's got a really big job to do as performance director. We've discussed that. Um, he's been asked by the board to undertake um, this on a one-match basis. That's been made very clear, uh, and he knows going back into the performance director job that you know Project Brave, the implementation of that, and the management of seven squads, uh, including the youth teams, um, are his domain. Yes, yeah, Stuart Regan there. Now, on to tonight. I am joined by the former Scotland striker Stephen Thompson. Stephen, first on that news, is it the correct move? Yeah, absolutely the correct move for me. I think uh, it's a big job uh, as performance director to roll out Project Brave and it needs its full concentration. On to tonight then. It's uh, a fairly inexperienced side. First time starters, Jackson, McLean is in. He's played, of course, once before. Ryan Christie also. Um, is it a positive selection? Yeah, I think so. It's experimental, but uh, I think there's a lot of energy in the midfield areas. Christie, who's been fantastic, fantastic so far this season for Aberdeen. John McGinn's in there. Callum McGregor, who's long overdue his first cap. So I think it's a positive selection. Dutch, of course, huge. Some big name players. What can we learn tonight, if anything? Well, because the games are friendly, not an awful lot, but it'll be a good test for the, the newcomers and the young players to see how they cope in the international uh, stage. Stephen Thompson for now, thank you very much indeed. 17,500 tickets have been sold for the game this evening. You know the drill, if you haven't got a ticket, you can listen live on BBC Radio Scotland. Sports Sound, kick-off is 7.45. Well, Gregor Townsend says he's taken over the Scotland rugby team at the right time as the side now feels it can beat the best teams in the world. Townsend's preparing for his first home match as head coach with Samoa visiting Murrayfield on Saturday. Kerry San reports. It's been quite a journey for Gregor Townsend. Now national head coach, it doesn't seem that long since he was Scotland's student standoff starting an international playing career. So how does he feel about his home coaching debut this weekend? Much more relaxed, I would hope. Uh, the reason I say that is by the Friday, Saturday, the coach's role is much less relevant than it is on a, on a Monday, Tuesday. The players should be doing the talking. No, no. Of course, things could have worked out entirely differently. Banking's loss was rugby's gain. And he didn't need his old computer to figure out he's picked a good time to take charge of Scotland after the most successful Six Nations campaign in years. You've got a team that's very confident. Um, if a team's winning, like they did in the Six Nations, there's not that much you, you have to change. Um, and I think they, they felt they turned a corner. So there's players that had been playing for a number of years, maybe not getting the, the wins, having a few close losses, but now they felt that they could beat the best teams in the world. Townsend, too, was a proven winner. Capped 82 times for Scotland, he contributed 164 points in the process. And he was in Scotland's last championship winning side, back when it was just the Five Nations. He was a title winner, too, as coach of the Glasgow Warriors. So can some of that success rub off on these upcoming autumn internationals? We have two teams in the top three in the world, in the, in the All Blacks and... Um, in Australia, we have Samoa have always been a tough opponent for, for Scotland. And then looking beyond that, I think we play every team in the top eight in the world, apart from South Africa, in the next six months. So what, what a great challenge it is for, for us. And we realise that we have to be at our best to beat the best teams in the world. He managed to beat the best as a player. Dungeon has done it! If he can do so as head coach, the nation will once again sing his praises. Kerry Ned San reporting Scotland, Glasgow. Now, a couple got more than they bargained for after hiring a van to move house in Aberdeen this morning. They found a four foot snake inside. But as quickly as it appeared, it slithered out of sight and it's still missing. Rebecca Curran reports. Snake in a hire van. Four foot Mushu, the corn snake, was found by a couple moving house. As my partner was getting back in the van, he opened the door and the snake had slithered round the side of the seat. So we called the SPCA and we've been stuck here since then because the poor snake's disappeared into the van somewhere. The man who claims he owns the snake is on his way here from Glasgow now. He said he lost his corn snake, Mushu, while driving a van like this one from Aberdeen to Elgin five months ago. The van was searched and parts of it were dismantled, but Mushu was never found. Corn snakes are not venomous, but they can bite. They can live without food for up to a year, but they do need water.
If he has been in there for a few months, they can easily survive that. The worry is more the temperatures. If, we, if, if, if he stays out, you know, especially now that it's getting freezing overnight, that's the main concern now. This evening, Mushu the snake still hasn't been found. The hire van will be taken away for closer inspection. Rebecca Curran, Reporting Scotland, Aberdeen. Our timeline is over on BBC Two at 7.30 tonight. Shireen and Glenn can tell us what's coming up. Tonight, we hear from the family of Kirsty Maxwell, six months after she fell to her death from a balcony in Benidorm, as questions remain about what happened. The new musical tributes to an old connection of war poet Wilfred Owen and a former Edinburgh hospital. Plus, with a new series of Scott Squad about to hit our screens, we hear from one of its stars. That's Timeline 7.30, BBC Two Scotland. Well, time for a look at the weather now with Christopher. Katrina, thank you. Hello there, good evening to you. Well, fairly breezy conditions to come this evening and tonight with a number of showers around. Let's take a look at the chart and you'll see that the showers that we've uh, had today across the far north extending their way south and eastwards and a spell of rain pushing through the southwest. And the winds will be strong from a northwesterly direction. In fact, gusting to gale force, if not severe gale force for the far north and the northern isles. So a cool night, but for most of us frost free because of the strength of that wind. Tomorrow, once again windy, driving in showers right across the country, but out with the showers there will be some bright, if not sunny skies, and certainly will feel quite chilly. By mid-afternoon, certainly across parts of the southwest, a little more cloud by this point through Ayrshire in towards the Glasgow area, Argyle, come further east, probably still quite sunny for the borders up towards the Lothians. Temperatures though, 6 to 9 Celsius, a cool feel and a few showers coming through at times. Further north, that uh, sunshine and showers mix continues. The bulk of the showers really across the far north and northwest and the northern isles. Winds here remaining strong, so those showers bluster at times some hail, maybe some thunder in the mix. And then the rest of the afternoon into the evening and overnight, we hold on to those showers, we hold on to those northwesterly winds, and again another sort of area of rain just giving a glancing blow to the southwest. And then to the weekend, we have cold air coming down from the Arctic, so it's going to be chilly both days. Here's Saturday, Armistice Day. Some sunshine, yes, but fairly frequent showers, particularly around the north and west coast. And it's going to feel cold despite the sunshine, just 7 or 8 Celsius. Again, in the far north and northern Isles, gales are likely. And uh, certainly looking ahead towards Sunday, Remembrance Sunday, a straight northerly, really, so it's going to feel chilly once again. Fairly frequent showers around northern coast and the northern Isles, but central and southern Scotland, some decent spells of sunshine, although, again, feeling cold. In the northeast, quite a bitter feel, and some of these showers potentially with a wintry mix, even to low levels. That's the forecast for now. Thanks for that, Christopher. And that's Reporting Scotland. I'll be back with the headlines at 8 and again with the late bulletin just after the 10 o'clock news. Till then, from everybody on the team right across the country, have a very good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>